Hi, and welcome to The Working Songwriter, the show where today's best songwriters come to talk shop. I'm your host, Joe Pug. Each episode here, we host a distinguished guest, and we ask them to go deep on their inspiration, on their process, on the general ups and downs of making a life in music. So, whether you're a grizzled veteran, ordering boxy Gildan t-shirts printed in a sweatshop for your merchandise store, or else a scrappy upstart, making artisanal screen-printed shirts that will be far too expensive for anyone to buy, this is your show. Because ultimately, it is what every writer seeks most, an ironclad excuse to put off actually writing. Hey, everybody. It's the second Friday of November 2020, and I thank you for joining us. This week's show is brought to you by Banzoogle. Built by musicians and for musicians, Banzoogle is an all-in-one platform to build a beautiful website for your music. I'm old enough to remember when you had to pay somebody called a web developer to get a website made, and it would always be some guy who demanded to be called Morpheus, who drove a tricked-out Mitsubishi Lancer with a sunroof that didn't work, and who's always trying to sell you blow pops dipped in ketamine. And old Morpheus would charge you about a thousand bucks for a website that was obsolete in six months, but it's the future now, you guys. That's not how it works anymore. We're allowed to have nice things now. One of those nice things is Banzoogle. Banzoogle powers the websites of tens of thousands of musicians around the world, from weekend warriors to Grammy winners. All the features you need for a professional website are already built in, hosting and a custom domain name, dozens of fully customizable design templates, tools to sell your merch commission-free, mailing list tools, social media integrations, the ability to do a commission-free fan subscription feature. Listeners to the Working Songwriter podcast can go to banzoogle.com to try it for free for 30 days and then use the promo code TWS, the initials of our show, to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. Uh, If you'd like to hear any of my music live in the coming months, every Sunday night, I'm over on my YouTube channel for Sunday Songs at 9 p.m. Eastern. It is a live stream. I will be live. That means I'll be playing some of my tunes. I'll be taking questions and requests from people in the live chat. It's become a really fun, interactive experience. I'm interacting with people in the live chat. Viewers are interacting with one another in the live chat. I'd like to say that we're building a little bit of a community over there, including many people who are listeners to this podcast. So come on over and be a part of it. Head to YouTube, type in Joe Pug, subscribe to my channel, and I'll see you there on Sunday night at 9 p.m. Eastern. Finally, if you enjoy this podcast, if you'd like to help it remain a viable endeavor for me, here's a couple things that you could do to help. First of all, you could become a supporter of the show over at Patreon. Patreon is a platform that allows you to directly support creative endeavors that you find meaningful. You just head to their site, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, you search for The Working Songwriter, or you search for my name, and then you sign up to kick in a few bucks every month for the show. Think of it as a voluntary subscription, a subscription that you don't have to pay, but that you just choose to pay because you dig the show. If just 1% of our listenership would kick in the price of a cup of coffee every month, it would make an immense difference. So thanks to everybody who's done that, and if you're not in a place where you can contribute financially... I get that. There's still a couple ways for you to help for free. The first way that you could help is by leaving us a review in the iTunes store. That's completely uh, free. Uh, And the second way is to just simply tell a friend about the show, spread the word about the show. The simple math on those two things is that they will help me much more than they will be a pain in the ass for you. Okay, I'll end all the harassment there. I hope you enjoy this week's conversation. Our guest this week is a Grammy-winning Irish-American singer-songwriter who's had many chapters in her still-unfolding career. Aoife O'Donovan graduated from the New England Conservatory of Music and went on to found the progressive bluegrass group Crooked Still, who gained a devoted following first in the Northeast and then nationally. Since then, 
She's released her own critically acclaimed solo recordings and also teamed up with Sarah Jarose and Sarah Watkins for the Grammy-winning band I'm With Her. She's performed and recorded with Jerry Douglas, Edgar Meyer, Stuart Duncan, Yo-Yo Ma, and the Boston Pops Orchestra. She was a frequent guest on Garrison Keillor's Prairie Home Companion and on Chris Thiele's Live From Here radio programs on NPR. Her songs have been recorded by Alison Krauss, a true fan of hers, and have been featured in HBO's True Detective. She's recorded for Signature Sounds, Yep Rock, Rounder, and Sugar Hill Records. Rolling Stone has declared that the spirits of her Irish heritage float through many of her songs. The Guardian has described her sound as lean-in music that has the ability to draw you in even further. And the New York Times declared her collaboration with Watkins and Jarose a supergroup. In fact, this podcast episode with Aoife is the realization of my long-held ambition to have each member of that wonderful group on this show. She was kind enough to jump on the phone this week and tell me about her journey so far. Aoife O'Donovan, thanks so much for taking the time to be on the Working Songwriter podcast. Take me back to when you first started, the first venture that really brought you onto the national stage, which was Crooked Still. You were still in uh, like the conservatory for music at that time, right? Yeah, I was. I mean, it was just, it was, I guess I had just started. It was my um, the beginning of my sophomore year of college that we started the band, although I wouldn't say that that was our our introduction on the national level. We were really a local band for, for many years. And uh, like, you know, a lot of musicians in our scene, I think getting getting our start in a, in a local music community really was just a, a huge part of what made us the band that we, we were and that we are. And um, really helped us cut our teeth uh, in kind of a, the local Boston circuit, then onto New England, and then eventually onto the national scale a couple of years later when we put out uh, our first record, Hop High. So what did that kind of uh, regional or kind of parochial scene uh, look like there in Boston? It was really special. You know, um, I first found my, my way to the Cantab Lounge in, in Cambridge in Central Square in 2001, right after Oh Brother Where Art Thou came out, um, it was my freshman year of college, and I, I had always been into folk music. You know, I was at the New Conservatory studying contemporary improvisation, which is a little bit of a subset of the jazz department, and uh, you know, grew up around folk music, grew up around Irish music, and uh, but but not so much uh, around bluegrass music or American old time music. And uh, it was really kind of during that year, that first year of college, and then really discovering the Cantab Lounge and discovering this kind of underground bluegrass scene that, that had, had been in Boston, you know, really since the bluegrass revival of the 60s and the folk revival of the 60s and had never kind of gone away, but had sort of, had sort of you know, maintained this low profile and that really took off after 2001, after Oh Brother Where Art Thou kind of put, put that, that music in the national spotlight. So I, we, we kind of, the band formed around friendships made at this little club, the Cantab Lounge, and uh, th- those were our earliest gigs. So that's where I met several, you know, lifelong close friends who were in, in those, in that <laughs> dank basement, that stunk of Budweiser, and uh, just really, really happy memories. Yeah, what is it about that age, like 18, 19, 20 years old, when you discover some some new music, whether it's American old-time music or for some people it's punk music? There's something about that age and, and discovering a new form of music that really can set you on fire creatively. It really can, and it's funny. I'm just smiling so big just thinking about that feeling and thinking about um, wishing I could kind of access that again. There's just that that, that abandon and that, that youth, that youthful energy um, of being a teenager. And I think maybe, maybe for, for, in some way, it's about sneaking into these bars and not sneaking in because you want to get drunk, sneaking in because you want to jam. Right. And I feel like there's something, there's something so special about that. I just remember, um, I met Chris Eldridge, guitar player from the Punch Brothers. We were standing in the back of the Cantab, um, waiting for somebody to let us in the back door. He was visiting on spring break from Oberlin or winter break from Oberlin. He was also in his sophomore year of college. And I think we were both probably 19 at the time. And, it was just who knew that, that, you know, 20 years later, we would be still close friends and still able to make music together, um, you know, traveling around the world. And I, I just see him all the time. I love that that's where we met, is waiting to sneak into a bar to, to jam on Bill Monroe tunes. It's just it's so special. And, and to be fair, some of us were trying to sneak in to get drunk. I just want to let you know. 
Uh-huh. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I probably was too. I feel like I, I, I partied so hard in high school. I think by the, those first couple of years of college, I was over it. You're, yeah, that's a good way to do it for sure. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's funny you saying that, you know, in some ways you, you wanted to almost like bottle that feeling and get back to it. But when I think about that time, I remember, um, you know, how much, how exciting it was, but I also remember how scary it was because at that time you're broke, you got no money. You, you don't know if this is going to work or not. I mean, if you knew that everything was going to work out for you the way that it did, it'd be super enjoyable. But, uh, in some ways, I, I don't know, at least for me, there was like a lot hanging over me. Of course. And I think that, I mean, we, we know that now more than ever, I think that being a musician and, and I, I say this often to, to anybody who asks me for you know, career advice, it's not, there's no job security ever. Even, even the most uh, successful musicians, it's still year to year. You, you might have income coming in from, you know, whatever sort of streaming services you get money every year or mailbox money, as they say, but it's still, you have to do it because you love doing it. And you have to, you have to, every time you, you know, set, sit down to write a song or get on stage to perform or, or anything you do. I just spent the morning signing records, you know, and that's, right. that's all part of the job, you know, and, and that's not those, you know, signing records. That's not what's going to you know get me off musically, but it's part of the job and you have to do it because as musicians, we're kind of constantly trying to find ways to make it work and ways to sustain a career in music. And at the end of the day, for me, what I, if I get to sing songs and write songs and play music with other people and I also get to make a living doing that. That just feels, it just feels so lucky. And I, I don't know, it's hard to say, like, what what would I have, how would I have gone about it had I known, you know, at the age of 18 or 19 when I was first starting to book, when we were first starting to book our own gigs and we were first starting to, you know, make, you remember the days of, like, making your own press kit and uh, making your own one sheet and burning CDs and sending them to venues around. I think, are we about the same age or how old are you? Yeah, yeah, like almost exactly the same age. Yeah. So it's like before the internet, really, I mean, the internet existed, but it, we weren't like sending emails to venues asking for gigs. Really, you were calling them up. And right. it's just, it's crazy. It's, it's amazing how things have changed, but, but it's also, they stay the same. The more they change, the more they stay the same. It's just a different, you know, some different methods these days. So yeah. they're still waiting for that callback. They're still waiting to see if you got the gig. And when you get the gig, you still get that, you know, I still get a pang if somebody calls and says, this festival wants you to come play. And you're just like, oh, yay. I know. They like me. I, I know that it, it never leaves. It, it that kind of harkens back to you talking about there being no job security. It's just anytime you hear someone wants you for a gig, <laughs> you know, it's just no matter how far you're you still, get, you're always like eager beaver. <laughs> yes, for sure. So you were saying that it was a really good thing for you guys to have gotten some experience on the regional level before uh, it became a more national thing. What sort of things did you learn in that time when it was sort of a smaller thing um, uh, that you took with you that that you think were really um, uh, advantageous for you? I think that that coming up in a local scene, and I think that, 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 you know, so many musicians will will echo this, that really becoming acquainted with your fans in, in a way that that's really meaningful. I mean, we still, Crooked still, you know, we still have fans that, that were at our first couple of shows, people that I know by name that I don't even know their last names. But when I see them at Crooked Still shows, we don't play that often anymore. But Dave and Betsy come to mind, Beth and Sammy, these couples who were the smiling faces in the front row of our camp shows when there were 15 people in the audience, they probably heard us play before we were even a band. And they kind of stuck with us as we went from the camp stage to doing, you know, I remember when we played our first show at Club Passim, and it was such a big deal to move from kind of the dive bar, no cover, tip jar thing to a, to a small club. And then, of course, that community was so nurturing to us. And then from there on to, really, when you when you know a town so well, you know the smallest venue and you know the biggest venue. Um, and obviously, we haven't played the biggest venue. We haven't played Boston Garden. And I don't think we ever will. But but it's really, it just just having that, that kind of rich relationship with your fans and, and the people who have watched you come up, who have supported you, who made it possible for you to go to the bigger cities who, who made it possible for you to make your first record. I mean, just all those little things. Um, I, I think just kind of putting in that grunt work is I, I I'm really grateful that I had that experience and that's not to, you know, to discount people who, who come to you know musical success through other avenues. But I think for us, it was really, it was really meaningful to pound the pavement and to really make those connections and have those fans that, that we still have. I love that. That's so true. You really can't fake seeing someone at like a bigger venue 10 years later uh, and and like the sense of success that you both feel, even though, you know, you're the one in the band doing the thing and they're just buying a ticket to the show. But there is sort of like this shared connection of like, we did something together. 
Of course. And it's, it's, oh gosh, it's really, really powerful. And I, 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 we just played some shows, I guess, not just at this point, it's almost a year ago, but in December we had a a little reunion and, you know, people, people just really showed up and they were and and yeah, they felt ownership over the project. They, they, they really had, I feel like that the fans at the Sinclair and our Cambridge show, there were people there who had been at, you know, every time Crooked Still has ever played in Boston, they were there. They've traveled to see us. And it does feel like a shared, a shared success, a shared victory. What did the writing process look like with Crooked Still? Were you doing most of it? And, and was this the first time that you had really uh, gotten into songwriting? Like, how did the creative part of, of that project work? So interestingly enough, and, and I know this is a songwriter podcast, this is a good topic. Crooked Still, although I had, had been a songwriter and had written songs, you know, when I was younger and also was, you know, obviously studying that in college, we didn't set out to be a band uh, that was doing original music. We were, we were mostly doing traditional music and at the creative process went, went really deep as far as the arrangements went. And we would get so excited, I'm sorry, just push the table, so excited about discovering old songs, discovering field recordings um, in, in, and putting them, giving them new life and kind of taking these old, old tunes that were standards and, you know, crooked stillifying them, you know, giving, putting our stamp on them. And, and we had such a, a great, team of people, uh, Greg List on banjo, who was kind of playing the banjo in a way that, that many people weren't, and people actually still don't play the banjo really in that style. It's four finger, um, bluegrass style banjo. A lot of people play shrug style, three finger. So we had this kind of weird banjo sound. And then at, in, you know, in the beginning, we had Rashad Eggleston, who was a trailblazing cellist, um, and, and uh, you know, the kind of high female vocals and bass, and no traditional bluegrass instruments, no guitar, no mandolin, and no fiddle for the most part. So in the early days, it was really just about kind of putting our heads together and and being extremely creative and feeling very proud of the, you know, proud creatively of the finished product of all these really cool arrangements. And as the band evolved, we did add an element of of original music to it. But ultimately, that was maybe one of the things that that put the band on the back burner for for me for a while was that I did want to perform my own original songs and, and kind of focus on that for a while. So when Crooked Still kind of had it, uh, we put out, you know, our kind of final piece of recorded music that we put out, which is Friends of Fall in the fall of 2011. Uh, we kind of put the band on the back burner and we've reconvened several times for kind of reunion shows, but we haven't put out any new music since then. And I've been doing mostly original music of my own, under my own name and also with my band, I'm With Her. So it's uh, it's been cool. I think that the, the experience of collaboratively arranging music, um, really starting with just the bare bones of, of like an acapella field recording, has been so useful to me as I've been a band leader and also as I've been a collaborator. Um, you know, I, what comes to mind is collaborations on the American Acoustic Tour with Punch Brothers and I'm with her and, you know, as a member of the uh, Live From Here house band, just sort of having that kind of quick vocabulary for how to arrange a song and how to kind of, even, even if you don't have a lot of time, just to make it make it pop. I think those those are really you know, key skills. What are some of the things that you learned from the Crooked Still project that have helped you become a band leader? Like when you talk about uh, arranging a song very quickly, uh, what does that look like to you? Like if you sit down in a room, what are some of the things that you're looking for out of an ensemble when you're putting a song together? I think it's um, really the ensemble is, is a blank slate, right? And what, what I was just, just came to mind was a couple of years ago teaching at the uh, American or Acoustic Music Seminar at the Savannah Music Festival. It's sort of a, a kind of who's who of the young new acoustic musicians in America all come together. They're mostly teenagers um, to this sort of elite gathering at, at Savannah. And um, they have a faculty of, and they're kind of forming these mini bands and arranging music together. And I loved being able to step into that as, as an instructor, but also as a peer and really kind of help these kids, ha- you know, do exactly what you're just saying, become a band leader and, and figure out what's the best way to arrange a song and what's the best way to kind of dissect a song. So, you know, when you need to, you know, you, obviously there's the formulaic arrangements of a song where you say, okay, we're going to start with just the guitar and then we're going to have on the chorus, just down, you know, diamonds on the bass. And then the rhythm is going to drop on, on the chorus too. And there's a reason why those are so common because they really work. But I think being able to see see the bigger picture and and uh, you know just be creative about it and say how about we try it this way and how about we how about we start we start with the full band and then break down you know when the singing comes in or just things like that just really having having a wide vocabulary to 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 check to check things out to try things out and also I think one of the things that you learn very quickly when you're in a band is that you can't be too attached to your own idea and I think that's something that that I've I've 
really been been so fortunate to you know have been drilled into me as as a young young musician and hopefully have applied that in my own you know band leading uh whatever but all the times I've led a band just to sort of say okay these are my ideas but I I want to hear your ideas and I'm I'm open to my idea not being the best idea and and really being able to collaborate in that way yeah not being attached to my own ideas has been great for bands that I've been in but primarily for my marriage too uh, it's really <laughs> <laughs> exactly. See, that's, that's, it's, you, the, be, being in a band is exactly like being married. You're just married to more than one other person. <laughs> <which> can <lead. laughs> which can lead to complications. So even as uh, Crooked Still is is going on, you must have been burgeoning as a songwriter, though, because uh, relatively early on, Alison Krauss became a really big fan of your songs and, and cut some of them. So can you talk about how, uh, as you're doing... As Crooked still is seeing this success and is is taking on its uh, uh, the life course that it's going to take, can you kind of talk about this parallel track of yours that will become your solo career and that would go more down the songwriting path for you? Like, how, how did that start and and how did that um, how did you make it come to fruition? That's really a great question, and I know you've had Sarah Jarose on uh, working yeah. songwriter, um, and she, uh, you know, one of her mentors is this incredible uh, A&R guy and dear friend of ours, Gary Pachosa, and he, I met Gary at the Turner Festival in Denmark in 2006, and I'll never forget it, we became sort of instant best friends. He didn't have his luggage, so he wore the same denim jacket and jeans for the entire six-day festival. <laughs> um, it was hilarious, and it, it, that's just a funny, it's just a funny side note, but he really, um, just was, was very curious about what, what I was, what I had going on. He loved the band, he was crooked still, but he, he, was, he was really curious about what, what I was working on kind of behind the scenes, as you say. And, uh, he invited me to come to Nashville and, uh, just cut some demos of original songs. And I did. And it was my first time being in the studio, uh, doing original songs and working with, with a producer like Gary. Um, it was, it was great. It was a great experience. And, about a year and a half later, I think Barry Bales had texted me or called me and said, you know, uh, Gary Pachosa just handed us a CD of your demos and we're listening to it. We really like it. Can you give us a call? And I remember talking to them or talking to Allison and her manager at the time, and, and they were really interested in a couple songs. And it was just, it was bizarre. It was a totally bizarre uh, thing to happen at that point. The first song that, that she recorded, or actually the only one that she ended up putting out was Lay My Burden Down. But it wasn't on her record at first. It was uh, the final scene of a movie called Get Low. So it was on the soundtrack to Get Low. And then she ended up re-recording it and putting it on her record, Paper Airplane. Right on. Yeah. And, well, that's kind of interesting because in a way that things come for full circle because she was so intricately involved in the Oh Brother Where Art Thou soundtrack that you said kind of uh, – it was that kind of musical renaissance uh, that got you into this in the first place with uh, uh, exactly. Uh, in Boston. Exactly. And she's such a, I mean, she's such a hero of the, of the scene. She's, she's one of those vocalists who, I mean, she really is without, she's fearless. She, nobody can do what she does. And to sort of have her stamp of approval, I mean, really the, the biggest compliment you can pay a songwriter is to sing one of their songs and, and to have her, you know, be, even be interested in it was a compliment, but then to have it actually be on her record was so special. That's really cool. And so that must have certainly given you the confidence to go a certain direction. Would you say um, that Crooked Still Coming to an End uh, was uh, in part because you were starting to write music or did you get more into writing music um, because Crooked Still Came to an End? I mean, not, no, I, I was always, I was always writing music. I mean, Crooked Soul was never a full-time band. That's the other thing to kind of keep in mind. Everybody was always doing other things. Mm-hmm. Uh, the whole time Crooked Soul existed, we were, we were playing a lot. And I think it definitely appeared that we were, you know, a full-time, you know, hardworking ensemble, but, but Rashad had his own thing going on. Um, I have, have a group with two other women, uh, Ruth Unger and Kristen Andreessen. And we did sometimes, why was that with you on Mountain stage or was that Crooked Soul? Um, I think that was Crooked Still. I think it was Crooked Still, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, but anyway, Mountain, sometimes why we put out a couple of records of, of all original music that we wrote in 2000 and, I think 2006 and 2009. So it was there. There was there, there, there were things happening that weren't Crooked Still, and I think that uh, when we kind of finally decided to hang it up, it was just it was just time to, for people to sort of go in different directions. And Craig had the Deadly Gentleman, and, and um, 
you know, people wanted to be home more and, and it was a really natural end and there were, there were no hard feelings, which made it very easy to sort of pick it back up again when we wanted to pick it back up again. Um, it wasn't like we had a, some sort of implosion, which I, I think happens often in bands that, that do a lot of touring, especially when they're young, you get to a certain point, you grow up and you're like, ah, I don't like these people anymore, but that's not, right. that's not at all what happened with Crooked Still. So it's funny. I've had um, so many but, misunderstandings about Crooked Still. It seemed like because from the outside, I'm just telling you as an observer from the outside looking in, um, it seemed to me like that band has had, especially almost in its afterlife, such a, a big effect. It's so kind of well-known and has gotten more well-known over time that it, it had always felt to me like that was uh, like your main thing for, for that period of time. But it, it was, in fact, something completely different. I mean, it, it definitely was my main thing for that period of time. And it's also how I think how everything else that has happened since is because of Crooked Still. You know, that's how I met everybody that I know. Sure. It was it was a huge part of, of it is a huge part of my, my career and definitely of my catalog. And, and speaking of what's happened now, even in the last year, um, this whole new group of people have been exposed to Crooked Still via gaming because we we had a bunch of songs in this big video game called The Last of Us 2. I, I don't know anything about video games, but I had so many people text me who are gamers and say like, holy shit, I just, you know, I, I'm playing this game. Like, we, you know, it, it, was, it was this huge game, this huge rollout. The trailer came out two years ago and the trailer had two Crooked Sales Note songs in it. And it, you know, it was like immediately millions of views on YouTube for the trailer for a video game. I didn't even know that was a thing Wow. Um, that video games had trailers. And then the game came out and, you know, it was released at midnight and people stayed up all night playing the game. And, and there's a part of the game where the character, like, you know, takes our record off the shelf, shake them by, and she's playing a Crooked Cell song on the guitar. It's like really, it's just so funny that and they're making an HBO TV show of the game. Like it's this, this real, it, that definitely led to a lot more interest on Crooked, uh, for, in Crooked Cell on streaming services which has been really cool to see. And so it does have this sort of, yeah, this, the, the afterlife of Crooked Still going strong. I mean, you know what's so funny about that is uh, you just never know what new mediums are going to do for something. And I, I can just imagine someone in, in like 2005 saying to your band, like, well, this is how it has to sound to get onto radio and da 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 And like, you know, fast forward 15 years and an entirely different medium that works perfect for, and it just it reaches a whole new generation of people. You could never predict that. Of course. And it's, uh, that's, that's, yeah, of course. It's so crazy. It's so crazy. And what's next? I mean, I, I didn't even know just, are you into video games? Do you, do you know about these crazy video games that are, that are like really like real people walking around and it's like no. a movie. It's like watching a movie. No, no, I'm, I'm, are, you know, I played things. some Madden NFL when I was in college, but that, that was about it. That's kind of why I left it. <laughs> I feel like I stopped after like Super Mario Brothers in sure. you know, 1989. <laughs> yeah, no, but but I do know that it's it's a thing. It's funny sometimes when you scratch the surface of something and you start hearing from people in your life that like never talk to you about your music. Like the one time that that happened to me, I played Prairie Home Companion 10 years ago and I started getting phone calls from like members of my family in in like Dayton, Ohio that I hadn't talked to in like 20 years. <laughs> you know what I mean? They were just so proud. Well, yeah, because it's it, it wasn't necessarily a program that a lot of people in my life listened to, but then across the country, obviously, it had a huge uh, listenership. And you just start to... It's just interesting to see which mediums get into which parts of the country, which parts of the population. It's... it's um, The medium is the message, in a way. Of course, yeah. And, and it's just and this constantly changing thing. I mean, even Prairie Home Companion became live from here, and now that's off the air. And what what are what are sort of the next ways that, that that our scene will have to kind of connect with people? Maybe it's, it's streaming services, it's gaming, it's. I think radio will still be a large part of it, but it's it's just time. You know, it remains to be seen. We'll see if radio, be, be, you know, continues to be a big part of it. I, I guess that it still is for certain types of music, but I think streaming has really, it's really changed people's ability to to hear new stuff. It has, and I think that there a lot of people are really, a lot of musicians are really anti-streaming, but I, I think that it's been, I've seen a lot, I've seen more positives than negatives in my own, you know, career from, from streaming. I certainly have too. I, I've always been a big proponent of it, and I, but I actually just had a guy on the podcast recently who was like a Nashville songwriter for a long time, and he kind of explained to me, he was like, look, if you own your master's and you have an interest in, in your master's, streaming's good for you. 
if you're just like a publishing person, like a writer that makes all your money off publishing, streaming is apparently no bueno. But then what, what is bueno? Like, I mean, did, did that the old style of buying hard copies of CDs at, at a record store? Cause that's just, I mean, no, he was saying, like that's the times that are- he was saying that the only re- way that you can still do that in Nashville and, and make a living is for songs to just straight up be on the radio and get residuals from that. Right, 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 right. Um, like believe the actual, me, actual hit. I, I don't really understand it either, but I'd always been so bullish on streaming. I'm like, who wouldn't like this? You have a store in everybody's pocket. It's great. You have no cost of goods sold. And uh, I, I guess there are some people that, that don't dig it, apparently. Well, a friend of mine, actually, the bass player in Cricket Cell had a great point. He's like, you know, you sell a CD and it's $15 and people can listen to it a million times. But if mm-hmm. somebody listens to your album a million times on Spotify, that's more than $15. Right. So, so right. it's like, it, it's, uh, it, it, it just, it just depends on it. But I think that also the discovery of new music, it, that is really, it's like, that's what people used to have. You know, I think even in the eighties and nineties, you'd go into a record store and you would discover music. They would have those stations where, mm-hmm. you know, you'd have six new CDs and you could put the headphones on and listen to all of them. And you had the time to sort of decide people people were browsing music in you know in record stores but that's just not the people haven't been doing that for a long time you and re- i think that uh that streaming has, has made it easier to sort of browse and to to have things that you love land in your lap really really and uh I, i'm not going to admit that i know about uh listening stations in record stores because that would really date me there uh <laughs> <laughs> come on uh, you already said we were the same i know i know i know um <laughs> The holidays are swiftly approaching and you have a problem. The problem is you need to get a gift for somebody that you love, but you are lazy. You're probably going to leave this task until the last possible minute and then end up with some disappointing, meaningless piece of trash. So let me solve your problem for you. In fact, let me help you win your holiday season for a limited time only I'm offering handwritten lyrics to any one of my songs in my merchandise store. That is custom, written to order by yours truly, dedicated in any way you please, and best of all, arriving already framed. So you don't even have to worry about your procrastination coming to bite you in the framing process. All you have to do is go to joepug.merchtable.com. That's J-O-E-P-U-G dot M-E-R-C-H table dot com. And I'll handle the rest of it myself. Your lyrics will arrive handwritten, dedicated, and framed. And you will win your holiday season with your awesome custom present. Head over to joepug.merchtable.com to pick up your set now. One of the really remarkable things about Aoife's creative journey so far has been her ability to form creative projects with other strikingly talented artists that then become more than the already abundant sum of their parts. And there's a lovely poem by Gerard Manley Hopkins that speaks to the divine nature of being able to look past oneself. It's entitled, As Kingfishers catch fire. As kingfishers catch fire, dragonflies draw flame. As tumbled over rim in roundy wells, stones ring. Like each tuck string tells, each hung bell's bow swung finds tongue to fling out broad its name. Each mortal thing does one thing and the same deals out that being indoors each one dwells, selves, goes itself, myself it speaks and spells, crying, what I do is me, for that I came. I say more, the just man justices, keeps grace, that keeps all his goings graces, acts in God's eye what in God's eye he is, Christ For Christ plays in ten thousand places, lovely in limbs, 
and lovely in eyes not his to the Father through the features of men's faces. So you, you begin your solo career um, in, in the early 2010s. Um, it, was that, um, how do I put this, was that scary in a way to be going out on your own or was it exhilarating or, or was it some combination of the two? It was terrifying. I mean, it was, it was really terrifying. I think um, just to sort of draw the, the correlation between the band and the solo thing, again, when you're in a band and you're, you're doing something, you it's, you know, you're a team, you have teammates. And when you're a solo artist, you know, you, you don't, I mean, you do. I have a great team, obviously, like my manager and the, my agent and the people that I work with at, at Yep Rock, but it's, it's not the same as, as getting in a van and having, you know, everything that you do is, is all for one, one for all. Right. Uh, so that, that part of it was, was really scary and still feels a little lonely to me at times, um, you know, as a solo artist. But that said, it's, it's, I think, making albums of original music and of course I only have two solo albums or three, I suppose, um, at this point, um, and I'm currently working on another. It it's it's I love singing songs, you know, that, that are that I wrote. I, I love expressing myself in that way. Um for, for it, it, that maybe maybe sounds obvious, but I think because I didn't do that for a long time with Kirk Still, just to get up on stage and really be able to tell a story through my music for the whole concert, you know, sort of interspersed with some covers and uh, some traditional music. It, it just, for me, it feels, it really feels cathartic to get to do that. And so that part of it, I love. And there are, there are things about it that I love and there are things about it that, that I wish were different, but I feel lucky that I, I have bands still, you know, I have my solo project, but I also for the last couple of years have had them with her and been able to just kind of do both of those things. And then also doing little duo tours here and there and getting to kind of do my solo thing. But with the duo, I did a tour in 2017 with Chris Elders and Julian Lodge, it's Aoife O'Donovan, Chris and Julian. And we kind of did double bills and we collaborated for, you know, half the set. And those kinds of things are, are really fun to do as well. Kind of, I, love, I love being able to mix it up and not, not just, you know, do one thing. That's one of the things that I really, really admire about your career is how many different looks you're able to to do on either you know records that you've done or or different shows that you take around the country it, it seems to me that like when you're thinking about touring that you almost think about like like <laughs> if i could criticize myself for a second to me it's always just like all right well let's just go do another joe pug tour i'm going to do that again whereas i i think it it could have been a lot better uh if i had kind of tried to visualize uh giving audiences new looks. I mean, how do you visualize those things? Are these things that just sort of uh, organically happen or do you kind of game out like, all right, well, I just did a tour as uh, under my own name. So now I'd like to do one duo. Now I'd like to do one. I'm with her. Uh, it, how do you visualize those things yourself? I really have to give credit to my manager for this. And first of all, I, I think that your touring life has been an incredible thing to watch. And I've been such a fan since the first time I saw you, uh, you know, at mountain stage, Thanks. whenever that was, it was probably 10 years ago or more. I know. Um, man. And, and yeah. I've seen you at various festivals. And I remember coming to your show in Brooklyn and, you know, buying a ticket and walking down fourth Avenue to go see you at the rock shop. I just had that, that really vivid memory of that. Oh yeah. Time ago. God, that was a long time don't, ago don't, too. Yeah. <laughs> don't kick yourself for your, for your lack of looks. <laughs> Cause it's a good look. But, um, for, for me, I, I would have to give a lot of the credit to my manager, Ben Levin, who, um, who I've been with since 2014. And he, he's just one of those, those guys who he just has a really, he just has a really big vision and he's really able to think outside the box and talk about not being attached to his ideas. He, he's just, the thing I love the most about working with him is he's always throwing out ideas and some of them are horrible. <laughs> but he's not, he never gets offended if you're like, that's a really bad idea. He's like, okay, just had to throw it out there. Just had to throw it out there. Yeah. And he just, he, he just kind of, <laughs> people ask him, like, does he ever sleep? Because he sends emails at four in the morning. and like, I just had this idea for this, this tour. Or how about this collaboration? Or how about this? How about this? And it's, it's been really helpful and kind of kept me on my toes to have somebody on my team. He's really my, you know, my ultimate teammate is my manager and, and we're very close. And I really respect his opinion. And if he says, I think you should collaborate with this person, or I think, how about doing this tour? Um, it, it just kind of happens really naturally. Uh, and I think that in, in our little scene, 
you know, like all of the managers are buddies and all of the musicians are friends. And therefore, so maybe it does feel a little bit like, oh, you just did a tour with Mel McKelney and now you're doing a tour with Chris Eldridge and then you have this project with, like it, it sometimes feels a little insidery, but but I think musically it it um it, it makes a lot of sense. And and the I'm with her project, I think we would all say that we owe it to our our three managers who worked together kind of tirelessly and created their own band. Basically, they're like a threesome that they they just love each other so much and they're kind of always coming up with ideas for the band. I think that that's in large part why that project was so successful because we had th- not just one but a team with three managers who all sort of shared that same ethos of like, you know, once we're going to have ideas together, nobody's going to be too attached to their idea. It's not my way or the highway. And it was just a really cool thing to sort of watch that unfold over three years. Well, I, I didn't know that the business end of, of that band I'm, I'm with her was so kind of integrated in a way. And now that I know that it, it kind of makes sense why um, it, it was able to have such a, from like out of the gate with you guys, you and the two Sarahs, like it, it always felt like it was a project that had always been there. You know what I mean? Did it feel like that to you? hundred percent. I can't even remember, you know, yeah, it feels from the first time we sang together at Telluride, it felt like, oh, this is, this is just what we do, even though we hadn't done it before. Right. And it was so natural from the beginning and really at every single step of the way, it, it was like that. And I think that that just, we just have a really good interpersonal chemistry as three friends and we have a really, you know, incredible creative chemistry as writers. And then as, as singers, I think that was the thing that was most obvious from the get go. Um, and all the rest just kind of fell into place. And it, it, was, it was and is a very creatively fulfilling project made possible by the team. I think that there's sort of the business side of it. Yeah. That's sort of boring and, and not, not, you know, fun to talk about, but it, it the business side of it really became almost a part of the creative team because we, we have so much trust in our, in our management team. And, and I think all of us would give them that credit that they just, they were kind of constantly kind of kicking our asses and saying, why don't you guys do this? Why don't you try writing this? Or even with the call my name song that was really, you know, pushed along by management saying, like, you guys should write a new song. You guys should write a song. How about working with Mike Elizondo for this song? And that just came together. We love, we just are so proud of that and and love how how it came about. You know, I, I think it does make sense to talk about the business end of it because I, I know in my creative life, I've seen this a million times. I would wager that you've seen this a million times, which is friends that have a really cool project or a really cool idea, uh, but it, it never, it, they never figure out a way to communicate that to a lot of other people. You know what I mean? And so you do need kind of smart um, passionate people on the business end to figure out how to take creative work and get it to the people that they know will love it. Right. Uh, it's, and, and, it's true. And, and, and you trust, I think is also a really big part of it. Oh, sure. 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 I mean, uh, because if, if trust breaks down with someone that you're working with on the business end, everyone kind of retreats to their own corners and then recriminations start. And I've been there before. That's no fun. <laughs> For sure. No, and I think we all have. Actually, I just, just had the thought that, that it's an interesting analogy is um, my, my daughter just had her birthday yesterday. She's three and, and she's been thinking about, you know, when she was born three years ago. And one of the things that I think made the experience so positive for my husband and me was the trust that we had in the medical team. And I think that when I've heard stories from friends who haven't had a, a good birth or however you want to say it, it's really been because they didn't fully like their doctor or they didn't have, they just didn't trust the people who were helping them bring the thing into the world. And it's really similar, although maybe a hilarious anecdote or, or um, um, comparison that the, the, the managers in the business side, they are the people who are essentially birthing your project right? <laughs> and getting it out there. And you have to trust them. Otherwise it's not going to work. No, totally. I remember when, when my son was born, uh, my wife and I had a great deal of trust in, in the, the medical team that was doing it. And at some point a decision had to be made about something. And, uh, we both looked at the doctor and we were like, well, you're the doctor. So, so tell us what to do. And afterwards the doctor was like, Hey, you know, thank you for, for just trusting me on that. And we were like, well, yeah, man, like you we didn't go to medical school. <laughs> we don't know. We just trust exactly you. exactly 100%. I'm sure it was a similar situation for us. Just hundred percent. The doctor, she knows, she knew what we wanted to do and it didn't work out that way, but we totally trusted her. So therefore there was no, you know, there, there were no negative, you know, emotional after effects, I think. And yeah. 
I feel that, that that can definitely be said for a lot of, I mean, I know people have had musical experiences where you make a record, you're so proud of it, and then the, the rollout doesn't go how you want it to go, or the press doesn't come in the way you want it to come in. And obviously, we don't have control over that, but um, I think I think just having a, having a good team in place and, and having a good band in place and just being, surrounding yourself with people that you, that you care about and you want to make music with, um, you know, it should, it should extend to the business side, in my opinion. So even though it has felt from the outside looking in, like I told you, um, that uh, uh, I'm With Her has kind of always been here and you said that you almost in some ways felt the same, I'm sure that the the experience of actually doing it has changed your creative process. So uh, what ways, how have you now been formed uh, by that band rather than the other way around? I think I, I learned so much from, from Sarah and Sarah. I think um, probably the biggest, the biggest thing that's, that's changed in the last couple of years is really my own confidence as an instrumentalist and uh, being able to be in a band with them and kind of constantly being curious, like, can I hang with these virtuosos? I mean, literal virtuosos on fiddle and mandolin um, as, you know, as a rhythm guitar player. And I mean, I'm, I'm in no way at their level in terms of their virtuosity, but I feel that they really helped me, um, gain confidence and become a better guitar player over the course of the last two years. And mm. I, I'm, for that, I'm, I'm so thankful. And I think that, that as we've sort of haven't really toured in the last, you know, since February, and, and that was, that was pre, you know, predetermined that was, that was, that was planned before the pandemic. And we all had new things come out right around the beginning of the pandemic. Um, I, 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 I was going to take, take that, take that confidence and take that sort of um, just that, 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 be thinking of myself as not just a singer, but as a sort of a more full musician, I think for a long time. And still, I definitely think of myself as a singer and not, not an instrumentalist. People say like, Oh, what do you play? I say, Oh, I kind of play guitar. I play piano a little bit, but you know, I'm, I'm a singer. But I think after the last couple of years of touring with, I'm with her, I, I can now kind of, you know, more confidently say I'm, I'm a singer and I play guitar and yeah. you know, I, I, <laughs> I can stand behind that. And uh, th- those two women are just, so wise and they have so much so much uh, versatility in what they can do i think vocally one of the things that was the most fun about that band was that the three of us could really kind of switch switch between the high part and the low part and the melody and really play around with the timbres of our voices to kind of suit the song and to to make the songs really come to life and, and be really different from one another so i think that that was a, a really great takeaway and just sort of the the kindness that, that I feel like the three of us showed each other over the course of the, the two years of touring. It was really, I mean, it's, it's, it's possible to not sound gushy when, when we talk about the band, because we really, we really do love each other and uh, look forward to kind of reconvening in a couple of years when, when we've kind of put out these solar rock records and kind of gotten a chance to flex those muscles a little bit as well. You know, he, hearing you talk that way about it kind of strikes me that maybe the reason that that can kind of exist is all three of you could go out, and do go out and do your own thing and could exclusively make a living doing that. So it seems to me that like when the three of you come together, that seems like a pretty low pressure situation to do something because none of you quote unquote need these records to do anything for you. Yeah, exactly. I think that that's a really good point. I think it's, um, that's, we were all, you know, a little surprised that, that we were able to tour behind the record, the one record for so long and that people were still, you know, really excited to come to shows uh, even though we, you know, it wasn't like we had a, a vast catalog of, of five or six albums to kind of pull from over the course of two years. It was really just one record with with a single, and then kind of you know bits and bobs from our various solo catalogs. So it, it was, uh, yeah, it was a really special project. Yeah, but that's the killer part. You get to the, all all of you get to cherry pick the best songs from your from your catalogs to put into the show <laughs> too. I mean, that's that's killer. Totally. It was really fun, actually. Um, over the second summer of touring, we, we kind of started doing a little one mic section in the middle of the set, and we would do each of us would do kind of a solo song from our from our you know solo records, and we'd all gather on the mic, and then we ended up doing this bluegrass medley that really became a highlight of the show over the summer um, the summer of 2019. And yeah, really miss that of singing singing all together on one mic. That's the, that's the, the biggest thing that I miss in this in this COVID era. You mentioned that, uh, you know, there's a fair amount of kindness just going on in that band, uh, being on the road with one another. I would imagine uh, that the subtext of that is that, you know, you guys have, everyone has 
begun to become parents, uh, uh, you and Sarah Watkins are, are parents. Uh, what has it been like? How has the transition to parenthood and being a musician who makes her living on the road? Uh, how has that transition been for you? And your husband's a musician as well, right? He is a musician. Yep, he's a cellist and a conductor. Mm -hmm. uh, the transition, you know, it's, it's funny, the transition from being a, a parent back to being a touring musician, I mean, like, you know, we were on the road, I was on the road till I was 35 weeks pregnant, and then oh wow, came home and, you know, had a baby, and then we had a photo shoot three weeks after she was born, and did a promo night, and then we went on the road, we literally flew across the country for our first tour, when my daughter was eight weeks old. Wow. So it was, it was very, that part like, I mean, I'm sure it was hard, but I really don't even remember it being hard because we were on a tour bus. We had an incredible nanny mm -hmm. and two moms with two new babies and Sarah DeRose, who was sort of the de facto auntie, always, always helping out and never making us feel like it was just, it was so special. And our tour manager, PK, and our, you know, our sound engineer, Tim, Yesterday, all of these people texted me on Ivy Joe's birthday, and because they were there for the first <laughs> for right. her first year of her life, right. of her life, and I think that it, what's been really, really wild is the transition, sort of out of that to being a full time stay at home parent. That's been really difficult for mm. me. Yeah. Um, just sort of to, to kind of go back to, or not even go back, but to sort of this is my first, this is my first time ever being a stay at home mom because I didn't really do it at the beginning. Right. You know, we were we were just working from the beginning. Yeah, I was home for three weeks, but really, really when she was three and a half weeks old, it's kind of when like stuff started to get into gear. And right. I had to go do a photo shoot, go play, go do a show. So to kind of all of a sudden for the first time in my life, be a, a mom without childcare, like it, it really gave me, a, I mean, a new respect for the women who choose that. And I think that's incredible. My mom chose that and I'm so grateful. And to the women who do that out of necessity. I mean, it's, it's just, it's a really, it's a crazy ride. And I feel so lucky that, uh, that I have been able to have a career um, and be a parent because it's, it's really hard. It, it, it is. I, I, uh, th that's basically what I've switched to. I have a four-year-old and a one-year-old. And as soon as COVID hit, it was like, you know, my wife still has her job. I'm still running my, my business from, from home uh, to the degree that I can. But, you know, it's just, um, you know, when COVID hit, it, there was no question of who was going to be uh, picking up the slack with the kids. <laughs> you know what I mean? And right. It's, and, and sort of same, same with me. My husband's had his job this whole time. Right. And he's been able to, he's in a Zoom, he's, he's a, you know, he's, he's a conductor and, you know, artistic director of two work three orchestras. So he's, in addition to kind of creating content and doing the musical side, he's also doing all the, the business side. So he's on Zoom all day. Right. And it's, it's just, it's crazy to, I mean, you, you know, you can totally relate. There, there, there isn't, you know, there are, it's just really hard to be creative at the end of the day when you spend the whole day with a three-year-old. Oh, and yeah, so, no, 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 no. That, that's just not a thing that, ha in, in fact, I, I started, you know, I, I went through like this whole negotiation with my wife where I was like, Saturdays are mine. I got to work on Saturdays. I'm going to do that. And I did about two of them. And I finally just got to a point where I'm like, hold on, man, I do need a day off at, at, at some point. Like I could, even my day, that, that I had rested to myself. It was just like, man, I'm just shot from the week. I, I can't think about writing a song right now. I know it's really, it's so crazy. And I just, um, we, we came down to Florida in September um, where we, we, my husband has, you know, he actually is working here. They're, they're doing live socially distant outdoor concerts with the orchestra, which is really special. Awesome. And, um, and we've had childcare for the first time for the whole pandemic. We were just kind of switching off with, you know, our family who live upstairs and, I would get a couple hours a day, but th that was when I would, would, you know, unload the dishwasher and fold the laundry and, right. you know, try to go for a run. And then by the end of the night, you know, it's like it's 830, your kids asleep and you're just like, I just need to have a beer and like watch Shit's Creek. Like I just don't, I can't, yes. if I open my guitar case, I might play a John Prine song, but like, that's all I got. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And even that sounds pretty ambitious uh, to me. <laughs> but, but, you know, I don't um, know. But it's, but it's been great. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, it's just been great being here because we've had child care and I'm, I'm, I'm so thankful to all the caregivers out there for, um, you know, working with families to mitigate risk. And, and it, I just have been loving the, I've had three mornings a week to write. I've been able to go into a studio and do some recording and it's just been like, I, I didn't realize how much I missed it. I went into the studio last week and did a whole demo of a new song and it just felt like I was almost in tears when I left because I just felt, I felt like myself again. 
Yeah. And that's not to say that I don't love my child or love being a parent because I do, but it's just it, a part of my, a part of myself is missing if I'm not doing, if I'm not making music, you know? It, uh, of course. And, and, you know, kids at this age, it, it just really is so all immersive. I, I was joking around uh, with a buddy of mine, uh, him and I have, he plays music as well. And we get our kids together in the mornings. Um, and he was, you know, saying, well, you know, my daughter took a three year three hour long nap uh, this morning. And I was like, you know, but the problem with that is even when you're watching a kid and they do take a three hour long nap, you didn't know that the nap was going to be three hours long. If you did, you could have done a bunch <laughs> of stuff. You know what I mean? But it's a bunch of hurry up and wait. Oh, totally. Of course. Of course. And it's also a bunch of, it's so you're lucky that you have two, because I actually find that when we were in New York over the summer, when we, we lived downstairs from, you know, my brother-in-law and, my sister-in-law and they have a four-year-old and when we had, when whoever was watching the kids had both kids, they just did their own thing. Yes. And then if, if you had both kids in the room, probably different with a one-year-old, but with a two and a four-year-old, two and a half and four and a half, they would just be playing and I could do emails. I couldn't like write a song or anything, but I could do a lot of stuff yes. if I was watching them for two hours and they were doing their own thing. But if it's just Ivy Joe, I'm you know doing fancy Nancy coloring books. I'm doing whatever the, the hell she wants to do at that time, playing with my little pony. It's just, it's just nonstop creative play so it does it's creative in the sense that it is it is a side of creativity when you're playing with toddlers because they are they have amazing imaginations and and i think that it it, it is making me a better artist and you know as as a whole artist for sure i love being a parent but it's um but it's yeah it's not it's not good for the old uh you know really work on a song for six hours in a row uninterrupted the one thing that i do find um and th there was an artist i had on here once and she it was amanda palmer and she put it this way she said you know being a parent the one good thing that it did for my creativity is it it stopped me from uh second guessing a bunch of stuff and just making myself make decisions a lot faster uh with songs and so i've I, definitely found that have oh, you found that great Yes, hundred percent. It's only since I've been here. Only since I got to, got here in September, mm -hmm. and I and I had like windows of time. Yep. And I just said, I'm going to finish this. I'm going to make this decision. This is how it's going to be. And I, I just that's that's such great advice from her. I think it is because I I took that from she said that a couple of years ago, and I was like, man, that is that's a game changer right there. Because, I mean, I'm sure you had this experience. I remember being in my twenties you know, no one t to be responsible for except for myself. And I would spend like hours wondering, you know, some little change of phrase in a song and it didn't matter at all. And I probably didn't even end up cutting the song. And it was like, I'm sorry. I, I, I think that that at a certain point, it, it's a waste of time and, and you're just chasing your tail. Right. And, oh, for sure. And, you know, and also, you know what, though, that's like, oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. The, the great thing about this is another thing that's great about being a solo artist, right? If you're, if you're on stage and you're doing a Joe Pug solo show and you want to change that phrase in Topeka on a Monday, <laughs> you can. Right. You know what I mean? Like that's, I, I think that that's actually a really cool, cool thing. And you listen to old bootleg recordings of, of some of the great artists and they're doing that. They, they do sing a lyric, you know, a diff differently from night to night. Sometimes they might have the honor whim say, this is, you know, What's the, um, uh, when I paint my masterpiece, aren't there a couple of alternate, um, you know, yeah. bridge lyrics to that, that I've heard, that I've heard them sing. Um, and I, I think that, you know, stuff, stuff can change. I was talking about this, I was um, doing a, a residency at, at Denison University and I was talking to some poets in a poetry class and talking about when you publish a book of poems, you're sort of, that's it. You, you right. The poem is published, the poem is done. When you're a songwriter, you, you can you can kind of change the lyric if you need to. I mean, Joni Mitchell, when, when she, um, I remember hearing her sing, maybe it was circle game or something. And she, she, in a live recording from late early in her career and in a live recording from late in her career. And she, she does a couple of lines differently and she, and, it, and, and the song has totally different weight. Right. Yeah. Or, or the next level thing that Kanye does where he just songs that are on Spotify and the streaming services, he'll continue to tinker with albums that are already out and re-upload things and stuff. <laughs> like it's completely malleable. Yeah. So cool. Um, well, listen, I'm so glad that we, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to do this. I know how precious time is uh, these days as, as we've just talked about. Thank you for following up so, again. Yeah. I, I so appreciate you kind of uh, following up a couple times and I apologize for any delay ever in getting back to you. No. And, um, I, I think you understand why. And I really Heck appreciate yes. that. 
Definitely. And uh, I look forward to whenever COVID madness is done, I look forward to seeing you out there on the road at some point. Absolutely, Joe. Be safe and all my best to your family. And thanks for thanks for the chat. Same really to yours, Eva. Thanks. Peace. Take care. Bye-bye. This week's show is brought to you by Banzoogle. Built by musicians and for musicians, Banzoogle is an all-in-one platform to build a beautiful website for your music. Use promo code TWS, the initials of our podcast, to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. Aoife O'Donovan's latest album is entitled Bullfrogs, Croon, and Other Songs, available everywhere music is sold or streamed. If before we meet again, you sit down to write, please remember, an expensive drug habit is not a song, a compelling Instagram account is not a song, and most importantly, reverb is not a song. So let all that take care of itself, and for you, just keep your eye on the song.